Okay, well, welcome everybody to my uh, last of three uh, main lectures. And uh, it's uh, devoted to numerical methods and their application to the dynamical evolution of uh, Baltimore star clusters in particular. And I already showed you this um, graphic up here, which shows the kinds of ways in which one can try and model a problem of star cluster, like this one here. Uh, ranging all the way from n-body models of the most detailed kind to scaling models of the most um, uh, sort of summarized kind. And even within these uh, four broad classes here, there are numerous uh, sort of uh, subdivisions and subclassifications. And in preparation for this lecture, I had a big scan of uh, papers which included the words globular star cluster and model, and then one of these things, scaling, fluid, moment, gas, water plant, Monte Carlo, and body. And although the total number of papers might seem fairly modest, that's a fairly restrictive uh, set of uh, words to uh, put into ADS. But you'll see that the end body modeling um, is as popular as all the rest put together. And then uh, not uh, too far behind it is the Monte Carlo method. And so I'll be saying most of uh, what I say in the next uh, 90 minutes or so about these two methods. Uh, I'll say very, very little about the numerical approach to solving um, these three sets of uh, approaches, uh, but just enough. Um, and since Mark is in the audience, I thought I'd better say something about uh, scaling uh, models. Uh, which have got uh, important uses. And here we go. What, is that? what I mean by scaling? Well, I, I mean uh, a very, very simple model which characterizes the entire of a cluster and its distribution of stars and so on in terms of just two or three parameters which uh, evolve with time. Uh, and in Emacs, uh, in its current manifestation, I think that's only two parameters, which is a half mass radius and the number of stars in the system, or something equivalent to that. Now, yesterday, um, you remember I was talking about Enon's uh, self-similar models, which also result in uh, equations of this kind. Um, for example, in the case of the isolated model, this uh, parameter of sign here is zero because, in fact, uh, the escape rate is zero. Uh, but there's a certain parameter mu which you can find from Enon's model, which tells you the uh, evolution of the half mass radius. And similarly, if you look at the tidally bound homological model, it obeys equations of the same kind except with different volumes of sign mu. And in a nutshell, Mark will correct me if I'm wrong, what his and his team's method does is to provide an elaborate uh, scheme for constructing these coefficients. Uh, and then you simply throw in the initial radius and mass and one or two other things about the star cluster, and out pops the entire 12 billion years of evolution, just like that. You know, so it's very, very fast. And I'll show you some uh, results of Emacs just to make Mark a little bit more nervous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to part of the lecture. Okay, so that's that's a scaling method. You can download that uh, if you find the papers uh, like this one here, and uh, run it to your heart's content. <coughs> then uh, the next stage up in elaboration are the, the so-called gas chords and uh, moment or fluid chords, and um, I'll just give you this uh, one. Uh, so a specimen example, so this is the sort of Lyndon Bell and Eggleton uh, approach to dynamical evolution. So it's basically treating the star cluster as a star, and you just have this funny uh, thermal, um, uh, thermal conductivity coefficient which is designed to move the thermal energy around on the time scale of the relaxation time. So you can more or less look up any paper on the uh, elementary treatment of the evolution of stars, and you'll find ways of uh, integrating these equations, which usually have to be done implicitly. This is basically a kind of diffusion uh, problem, and implicit methods seem to be preferred. 
And uh, these papers, in the context of stellar dynamics, give you some hint <coughs> about, about how that can be done. But I don't think any of these codes can be sort of downloaded from any work. So uh, you have to go and ask somebody if you're interested in doing this kind of thing. Then there's the Fokker-Planck equation, which I also talked about yesterday. And this is it in most of its gory detail. Um, and it's clearly an integral differential evolution equation. Uh, really a bit of an elaborate beast. But uh, people have studied that for a long time. There are one or two non-trivial things which you have to take care of if you're going to try and discretize this uh, differential equation. For example, this collision term here, we know that that is uh, equal to zero if you stick in a Boltzmann distribution. And it's a good idea to devise a finite difference scheme which ensures that the Boltzmann distribution is still an equilibrium um, solution of your finite difference scheme. Otherwise, it's the truncation error in your finite difference scheme that's going to drive the evolution. Um, because actually, what's left over in this term when you substitute the correct distribution function for a star cluster is really quite a small object by comparison with each one of these terms. And so a uh, small truncation error actually can turn out to be very important. Anyway, that problem's been solved. There's this uh, Chan Cooper algorithm goes back a long way, which uh, does that trick. And it assures also that you always result in a positive distribution function, which is a very good idea for a distribution function. And uh, that can be done. And again, I don't think you can download um, any code for uh, doing this. You have to find an author who's written one and uh, ask him to let you have it. Then Monte Carlo codes, I said that uh, this was one of the two kinds of codes that I was going to spend most of my time talking about. And um, I'm not going to say a lot about the details. They are extremely elaborate codes nowadays, but you can actually get one uh, buried within the news uh, library of uh, software, I think. Um, it doesn't actually work within the news context, but at least you can get the software and uh, put it together again and uh, let it run. So um, there's a Monte Carlo code which is available uh, in public. If you go back a long way to my hero and all, my other hero Spitzer, around about the 1970s, Spitzer's method is uh, not of much use uh, anymore. Um, but uh, Enon's <coughs> method was developed um, uh, by Stolokovic uh, in Warsaw. And his student, uh, Gersh, uh, rewrote the code and has kept it uh, up to date and uh, very elaborate. And <coughs> all of the, most of, almost all of the things that you would want to include in a star cluster evolution code um, in Monte Carlo style. And we'll see the advantages of that uh, later. Fred Vazio at Northwestern uh, also has a team uh, developing and updating uh, Monte Carlo code and so these two codes are what produce most of the Monte Carlo results in recent years. So the basic idea of the Monte Carlo code is that you don't actually follow the orbit of uh, each star, at least in the, in the Enon style methods. But you recognize that in a spherically symmetric um, potential, <coughs> which uh, is the more or less universal assumption of uh, the existing code, in a spherically symmetric potential, this orbit is characterized by two um, integrals, which are the energy or the specific energy and the specific angular momentum. And it's also the magnitude of the angular momentum that matters in a spherically symmetric non-rotating concept. Now, in terms of the collisionless Boltzmann equation, these uh, things really are integrals, uh, and this, the shape and, and size of this uh, orbit will never change. But if you add the two-body uh, encounters, which underpin uh, relaxation, then what happens is that uh, E and J diffuse through EJ space uh, in a way which you can uh, calculate in terms of the local density and uh, velocity dispersion and stuff like this. So the basic idea of the Monte Carlo code is that you build in 
that diffusion process or random walk into the evolution of E and J. And whenever you know E and J and the current positions or radii of all the stars, you can um, compute uh, what the new orbit would look like uh, after E and J have changed slightly. Then that puts the stars into different positions, you recompute the potential, uh, and, um, and keep on iterating that algorithm until the evolution is complete. Now, there's a lot of um, detail behind what I've said, and a lot of it was, was invented by Enon in his original uh, Monte Carlo code, on which he worked for about uh, five years or so, I think. But I'm not going to go into the detail. I spent an hour or two yesterday evening just sinning this lecture out a bit. So you'll be relieved to know that this is a kind of um, abstracted version of what you might have been exposed to if I'd gone a bit faster yesterday in the day before. Okay, now, what is the main advantage of the Monte Carlo code and why is it producing uh, a significant fraction of the papers on star cluster modeling? Well, it's simply the fact that it's so fast. The time step that you take in the Monte Carlo code, since basically all it's doing is relaxation, the time step is proportional to the relaxation time. I mean, it's not equal to the relaxation time, which might be three giga years or something like that, but it may be a hundredth of that, and that's still very, very long compared to the time step that you'd have to take as an N-body uh, integrator. And it means that the computational effort is actually of order N log N per relaxation time, N because you do have N stars to, to relax all the time, the log N because you have a certain amount of uh, uh, sorting to do uh, each time step, just to compute the potential actually. And uh, so that's nevertheless a very, very small load for something which is advancing you on the relaxation time scale. So uh, the load is about n log n per relaxation time compared to an n-body code, which is of this order for relaxation time where this gamma is a constant. This is the cool model thing which appears again and again in uh, two-body relaxation <coughs> things. Now what does that mean in practice? Well, in practice, people have uh, modeled um, a number of uh, specific galactic globular clusters over the last few years, including uh, 47 Tucani there, N4, N22 is something in there, and uh, Omega Centauri is, is there as well. Now what is this diagram? Each plus here represents one globular cluster in the galaxy extracted from the Hallis catalog. And these lines here, based on this rather simple formula, n log n for relaxation time, give you a simple scaling estimate of how long it should take you to do a complete 12 gig year of the lifetime of each of these globular clusters. And the globular clusters are, are um, plotted here according to their half mass relaxation time, it's a logarithmic scale, so this is 10 gig years here, and also the uh, absolute visual magnitude which is approximated for the uh, total mass. Uh, so this will be a logarithmic scale since this is linear in the, in, the ma in the magnitude. And it's based on the assumption that the global star clusters have more or less the same mass to light ratio, which seems to be uh, justified when you do more detailed modeling. So all of these, uh, so, so these are the sort of rich, big uh, globular clusters that you see in pictures of all the time. These are rather, um, sparse, uh, distended objects, which you don't see pictures of quite so much. I'll show you one later on. And these these rich uh, clusters, I mean, the, the kind that Shackley would have loved, you know, 100 years ago, these things take about a day in the Monte Carlo code to do the entire lifetime of the evolution. Now, and I'll contrast that with n body models soon. And uh, these contours are separated by factors of 10 in effort, so if you believe this scaling, this would only take about a quarter of an hour, uh, Paul 14. Uh, whereas some of the richest star clusters uh, might take upward of a week, something like that. One. But at least this is a very, very uh, fast. Um, I mean, no, nobody really objects to a simulation that lasts a week. You yeah, could do quite a few of those. Sorry, sort of any globular cluster could be modeled in about one day, plus or minus a factor of uh, of the extra 
Now, as I've said, it's a very efficient uh, method. You can readily add all sorts of other things in addition to um, uh, true body relaxation. You can add uh, uh, sort of parameter trials, stellar evolution. You can add binaries. You can add the tidal field to some extent. But then we start to get into the disadvantages of the Monte Carlo because doing this uh, properly is a bit tricky. In fact, you know, this is, this is always work in progress, I think. Nobody quite knows how to uh, simulate the complicated issues of tidal escape, which I've touched on uh, in a Monte Carlo code. It does assume spherical symmetry and no rotation. And I think this is possibly under development um, uh, now. So this may no longer be uh, an obstacle for uh, much longer. And then we don't include sort of um, long-lasting triple systems. And of course, a few percent of stars might be very well start their life as parts of long-lasting triple systems. And these long-lasting triple systems do form in binary-binary interactions, which are included in uh, the Monte Carlo code. So what one does is to, if, if a triple, uh, a long-lasting triple actually forms a binary-binary interaction in a Monte Carlo code, you simply take it apart instantly and then throw out the bits that are there, a binary two single. Anyway, this has been applied to a number of uh, problems accounting for uh, many papers which I uh, listed in my account. Uh, various uh, globular star clusters um, one open cluster, M67, which is almost as rich as uh, some uh, globular clusters. And then, uh, quite apart from the modeling of individual objects, which, which I suppose is my special interest, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of work being done in the Monte Carlo Accord on more general um, problems involving stellar dynamics, stellar evolution, uh, in the context of globular clusters. The origin of so-called blue straggler stars, dynamics of black holes, for example, um, just to mention two. Okay, now the direct end body technique. Just back to something which is familiar to everybody. So here are the end body equations as written down by Scott yesterday. Um, and yes, I think it was Lyman Spitzer who said that these equations have an appealing if deceptive simplicity. And indeed, it's a uh, more or less trivial matter to try and construct a computer program which will integrate these differential equations. It's, it's a slightly elaborate example of the kind of thing which an undergraduate should cope with. But to do it uh, efficiently enough um, is kind of a, a, a lifetime's work, which is fortunately being done. Now, um, so numerical integration of these equations in principle allows you to uh, follow the entire dynamic revolution of the star cluster over its life of history. I say from shortly after birth, because you've got to get, assuming the, the gas is somehow no longer there, uh, right to its death when, it, when it's dissolved into the galactic field. Uh, and the, the various cons or disadvantages of the Monte Carlo Accord, which I mentioned, uh, just don't uh, attach to this problem at all. You don't need to assume dynamic equilibrium, which I didn't mention, but that does underlie the Monte Carlo code. You don't need to assume that it's non-rotating. You don't need to assume that it's spherical. You do the uh, tidal escape just right, as, as right as any of you knows how to do it. It doesn't mean that this uh, scheme is entirely assumption-free, and we'll come on to that uh, later on, but it's the closest one can do to a faithful model. And of course, one does have to still add in these things like the stellar evolution uh, and how to cope with collisions between the stars, uh, which I mentioned already. Now, I said that this uh, could be done in a very simple way, and there's a number of uh, simple codes which you can look up uh, if you're interested in just playing with uh, the, the embodied equations. Um, I refer to the first edition here of Vinnie and Tremaine because I think this was one of the things which they excised in order to make room for much more when they wrote the second edition. But if you're a library, uh, there's an old uh, first edition still there. We find tucked in the appendix a nice old-fashioned Fortran code called Embody Zero sometimes, 
uh, ritual into it with the original shown. In MATLAB and C, you can go to this uh, group. Um, if you're uh, a Ruby fan, um, then uh, Ruby the programming language fan, um, then you can uh, go to this online guide to um, uh, Nbody codes. And then if you're a fan of any other language, and in fact, it is more or less going on to the side of the slide here, you can go to nbubble, which was our website invented just to allow people to upload um, uh, codes in any language of their choice. But I don't think there's an Emacs module for an Nbubble code yet, so if anybody is adept at programming Emacs, then you can try and uh, use uh, code with your computer. But for Steve's work, <coughs> there are really only three competitors for um, uh, doing uh, production runs, which would be publishable. Uh, uh, Starlab um, is probably no longer under development, but it's, I, I, I would say it, it, its simplicity of use is still something which uh, significantly um, recommends it. Then there's Nbody 6, which I think it's a sort of state of the art in the game uh, at present, and I'll say uh, a bit more about that. Amuse is, in some sense, meant to be the successor of Starlab. At least the people who wrote Starlab are basically the people who drove the development of Amuse. And uh, you can download this. It actually uh, opens up and runs out of the box. Um, without difficulty, at least in my last experience, which was about a year ago, that was the case, and I don't suppose we've opened since then. So you can download it. And the great advantage of Amuse is that you can put things together in an ad hoc, modular fashion. I mean, it incorporates several alternative modules for computing the gravity. You don't just have to add up the one of an R squared forces from all the stars on each other. You can do this with a tree code, you can do this with grid code, for example. Stellar revolution, you don't need to use the sort of fitting formula that almost everybody else uses to do the stellar revolution. You can actually do stellar revolution with a stellar revolution code, which really has a grid for the, you know, the radial dependence of temperature and pressure in each star in your envoy simulation and integrate that in parallel with your envoy code, if you've got the resources. And as long as the stellar revolution code doesn't fall over by the fall over. And then stellar collisions, you don't need to parameterize this as sticky particles or some other uh, simple cross-section um, like uh, NY6 does. You could actually turn over a pair of colliding stars to an SPH module within the mute, and then that would hand back to you the, um, the product of that uh, in the country. So it's got a lot uh, going for it. Um, you put the, the, the various modules together with relatively simple Python-based uh, scripts, uh, of which there are numerous examples in the downloaded package. You can incorporate not just stars and all the things that they do, but you can incorporate gas as well. But um, it's an imitation, uh, as far as I know, for uh, stellar dynamics of globular star clusters at present is that it doesn't do close dynamical interaction. Uh, somebody will correct me if I'm not up to date on that, but I think this is still under development. Um, so in what sense? If you want, you could put nbody 6 inside a loop, right? So yeah, then you might as well run nbody 6. <coughs> well, in principle, but you see, you wouldn't be able to run nbody 6, I don't think, with stellar evolution from some other model. model. You'd be forced. I don't think you could undertake the stellar evolution of nbody 6. It's not that modular. That's just <coughs> okay, now um, three digressions. Three. I want to introduce you to uh, the system of units, which is typically used in these n-body codes. Not everybody likes these units, um, but uh, they were invented by Enon <coughs> uh, in about uh, 1971 or so, and. Um, uh, they're actually not usually called in on units at present, they're called n-body units. And you'll find a Wikipedia page about n-body units. 
Uh, and um, it's simply my recommendation to the community to start calling these Enon units, because Enon did actually invent them. Um, and uh, it's, it's good to commemorate them. <coughs> Say more about that in a minute. So the idea of these units is that uh, you choose units in which the gravitational constant is one, the total mass of your star cluster is one, and then the variable radius is one. Actually, this is a slight modification of what Enon recommended, um, but it's typically what it's done. So these units are usually used in n-body systems, uh, simulations, and uh, it's a fairly trivial matter to figure out uh, how to uh, scale from the from these units in the n-body calculation to uh, what I might call astrophysical units. Now, these units are fairly convenient in variable equilibrium. The mean square speed is actually a half. The crossing time is two root two. The total energy is minus a quarter. These are slightly uh, weird looking uh, consequences of these units, but uh, these statements here are uh, perfectly simple. I haven't defined uh, very early radius in these uh, lectures. I don't think that it's very, very close to the half match radius for most uh, models of interest. Yes, my second digression is about uh, Michel Hénon, because he uh, uh, laid the foundations of so much of what I've talked about and what uh, the, um, the, um, uh, what, what, what the community uh, relies on. Uh, he died last spring, uh, and his, his major contributions to star cluster dynamics were in four areas. Uh, in the beginning of his research career, he was, he was uh, uh, investigating the theory of relaxation, and then he uh, turned his attention to the escape rate. He constructed these self similar solutions of the Fokker Planck equation, uh, and then he invented uh, uh, that version of the Monte Carlo model which includes a uh, specification of Enon units and what yesterday I called Enon principles. So quite a lot of what I've said in the last uh, couple of lectures uh, depends on what he did. I'm sorry, this, this picture is not a terribly good image, uh, but, but it's the only one which I ever took. And this is kind of how I remember him. Uh, this was in 1974 uh, at a, an IAU meeting in Belmont. And very interesting, well, there was a commemorative meeting about the uh, Enon in Paris last winter, uh, and there's, there's a number of very interesting video, videos of tributes to the Enon. For example, from James Biddy, from Sir Arset, from Rousseau, um, Paul Lyndon Bell, uh, and actually uh, Michel Enon's widow also, uh, which you can uh, get on uh, YouTube. So as I've said, uh, it's simply my recommendation to change our usage of n-body units to n-on units to um, commemorate the guy who actually did. <coughs> Third digression, astrophysical units. Um, I don't suppose this is an official word, but uh, very often in star cluster dynamics, one's using uh, parsecs for the unit of length, uh, solar mass for the unit of mass, and a kilometer per second uh, for the unit of speed, which conveniently leads to a unit of time, which is around about uh, one million years. So, for example, um, if you want to uh, convert uh, velocity from enon units, which is what the n body code might give you, is kilometers per second, what you've got to do is multiply by this thing here, um, and you'll presumably know for your star cluster what its mass is in astrophysical units, what its radius is in astrophysical units. And then uh, the only thing you need to know is what's the volume of G in astrophysical units. And I was about 40 when I learned what this uh, volume was. It's about 0 0.0043. And if you use that fact, it'll save you a lot of key horrible numbers into your calculator in order to do this kind of transformation. Sorry, yeah. what do you do if the star cluster loses mass? And uh, it's well. The, obviously, the transformation of units is fixed. Uh, so uh, I, I should basically say that um, this n here is the initial mass. Well, what I'm going to do is to show you um, just one or two examples 
uh, of the use of these uh, production cords, not unused, um, but uh, a Starlab example, because as I said, uh, I find Starlab uh, convenient for a sort of quick and dirty calculation. Um, I don't suppose the writers of Starlab would thank me for that description, but uh, at least um, it does have that use as well as others. So you simply have to download it, and then it's, it's based on a, a, a fairly transparent um, sort of command line uh, structure just to build in all the various initial conditions of the model you want. So this actually makes a plumber model with 1,024 stars. This makes the mass spectrum of the particles from a minimum mass of 0 0.5 units up to 5 units. It scales the resulting model uh, to the model uh, to so to the core units. And then Kira is the integrator, which advances um, the evolution up to a time 10 units here, and then it produces snapshots as a slightly esoteric uh, way of specifying the snapshot interval. And then this final uh, uh, command in the pipe takes these images and turns them into uh, well, it, Sorry, it takes this output and turns them into a whole lot of images with the prefix plumber run. So um, this takes about five minutes for 1,024 particles up to time 10 in n body or n on units, and then you can make an animated GIF uh, if you know how to do that. And this, this was the way that Mark and Peter allowed me to do that uh, last time I tried it. And uh, that was the basis of some of the simulations <coughs> which I showed you yesterday of the stars escaping into the tidal field and forming two um, uh, tidal arms. And then the state of the art in body six, I say this because it is um, uh, considerably faster than the star line. Um, it's, I, I think it's slightly more uh, inconvenient to use, and the output is certainly more inconvenient to extract but nevertheless, for its simple speed, if you're doing very, very large simulations, for example, it's unbeatable. Um, so again, you just have to download the code in, in various bits, plus a little bit of uh, documentation. You uncompress it, you uncompare it, you, you go to one of the subdirectories, you make it, uh, you go back, you go to a test directory for your runs, and then I'll give you an example of uh, how to set a run going uh, in just a minute or two. But uh, there's a very, very nice uh, reference on all of the various ingredients of N body 6, and by extension, quite a lot of other dynamical modeling of star clusters in this uh, book, which was the product of a lot of lectures which were given uh, in a summer school in Cambridge a few years ago. Uh, and you'll find lots and lots of details. Uh, not so much the code actually, but about all the various uh, trappings of the code, like stellar evolution and so on. Uh, in so, this is what I mean when I said that uh, using N body 6 is just a little bit more elaborate than uh, using Starlab. It's slightly less intelligible, should I say. So, this is the input file which you have to create in order to make N body 6 do a tunnel model, uh, like I just described. I mean, you can see some of the numbers here. There's 1,024, which is the number of particles. This is the output interval. This is the uh, final time of your run. This one here, though you never guess it, is the one which says making a plumber model. Uh, the maximum and minimum masses are given in here. And uh, that's what you have to construct uh, in order to do a, a plumber run. But I mean, I, I haven't actually invented all of that myself. It's basically one of the examples from uh, the documentation which you can download at the same time as the code. Um, I've changed one or two things because, well, there's, there's sometimes a bit of a mismatch between what the documentation says and what the code actually requires. Now, um, this is the code I, I, I've said that um, uh, actually setting up the inputs is a little bit awkward. 
Uh, I haven't shown you an example of the output because extracting the output is also awkward. And everybody has to do this in their own way, I'm afraid. It's a little bit like Christianity. Everybody has their own salvation. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's the same as uh, uh, M16. <coughs> yes. Could you use a muse as the IO for M16? I doubt I doubt you, you, you'd be better. You'd be better doing this actually. So um, for, for, for for the output, um, I mean, there, there was a great deal of it. I, I tend to use a sort of standard output, which which outputs junk, loads and loads of stuff, and I just extract what I need with suitable tools. Um, but um, you often need to reformat the output. It's it's done with very sparse uh, sort of. Um, numbers of significant figures in the output and so on. And, uh, but there are various things to watch for. The input file, I said that that was one of the difficulties of using the code. And you can actually construct these by hand with a little bit of care because Andreas Cooper um, uh, devised a, a nice tool called the cluster, which you can download. It's actually also included in, in the stuff you get from the N16 directory. And that allows you to specify uh, the input parameters in a somewhat more um, controlled fashion. Well, you know what Andreas Cooper looks like. This is what he looked like three years ago. And this just shows that he and I occasionally do observing. Uh, this is us in front of the 100 inch telescope of Mark Wilson. Um, of course, we weren't actually observing. But uh, we do actually go to observing it sometimes. This is our event here. Okay, n-body codes, as I've said, are um, um, designed fundamentally to integrate these differential equations. And whenever you, generally speaking, whenever you get a second order system of equations like that, you have to break it up into first order equations, which in this case involves the acceleration. And, um, you know, as I've said, if you're an undergraduate, you could take any package of your choice. Um, if you're used to Maple or MATLAB or you like using numerical recipes routines in any language uh, in which they're written, you could very easily devise an n-body integration uh, program. Now, it, it, the trouble is that no such general purpose program would be nearly efficient enough. Because I don't know any of these um, uh, commercial packages or semi-commercial packages which include um, one of the essential points for useful codes, and that is to allow the different particles to have different time scales. I think I have seen this in other contexts from time to time, but it's pretty rare. And, and almost all of the integration routines that you pick up from these places force all of the particles to have the same time step. Um, not necessarily the same time step all the time, but the same time step with each other. And that's a very inefficient um, uh, uh, drawback uh, for n one coordinates. Another difficulty which one would readily find is that close encounters are badly handled by a sort of straightforward uh, library routine. Um, and uh, in partnership with that, you've got to find some way of handling long-lasting binaries. Otherwise, you're always doing close encounters and you're frozen solid. I mean, anybody who's tried one of these things will, will have this experience that it marches up nicely and then it suddenly comes to a stop. And the reason is that it's trying to do something too difficult. And you have to devise ways of uh, allowing the code to uh, step over the problem efficiently, accurately. And then, of course, you've got to add additional uh, physics if you're doing uh, star clusters. Um, you've got to add stellar evolution ways of handling stellar evolutions and uh, so on. So general purpose packages are, are not good for, for doing this research. Let me say just a little bit about the integration algorithm. Uh, I mean, I had a lot about um, the inner workings of n 6 uh, before I started saying this lecture um, uh, last night. But I, I do want to say just a word or two about the integration algorithm. Um, the integration algorithm of choice is this so-called Ernit integration. It was actually sort of reinvented by a guy called Jun Makino. And it's an elaboration of your basic um, Euler 
algorithm for advancing the position and velocity of particles with a time step delta t. It includes, however, a couple of extra terms in what you obviously see is a truncated Taylor expansion of the position of a particle after time delta t compared with its initial position. A here is the acceleration, the rate of change of A is the jerk, and uh, you calculate these. Well, this one was the explicit summation of uh, the end body accelerations, and this one by an explicit summation of the derivatives of those terms. So there's a lot of work involved in calculating these two things. The velocity you also update uh, as well as you can with that information. But then once you've got to the end of the time step, <coughs> what you can do is to re-evaluate the acceleration and the jerk uh, at the new position and velocity of your particle. So that produces um, corrected uh, versions of A and A dot. Uh, and you add a second corrector stage to the algorithm, uh, which I've shown here. So V is the velocity at the beginning of the step, V prime is the velocity at the end of the step obtained by the predictor uh, part of the uh, algorithm. A prime is the acceleration at the end of the step. J prime is the jerk at the end of the step. Uh, and when you, when you uh, expand this in powers of delta t, basically, you'll find that um, the truncation error of each of these uh, equations is a order delta t fifth. So these are fourth order. Uh, this is the fourth order of um, in, in, in the way of accounting order, which uh, Scott mentioned yesterday. So um, armed with um, uh, the idea of uh, the Hermite integral and one, one feature, of, uh, and, in, and individual time steps, one feature of which I haven't really um, talked about, uh, I'll mention now, but you've basically got all of the ingredients for the dynamics part of an n-body core, uh, except for the handling of the close encounter and stuff like that. So, so here's the basic structure of an n-body core, including n-body six. You simply have to initially initiate, uh, sorry, initialize the conditions and velocities of all your particles. You have to figure out when is the next time to update the position and velocity of a particle. That depends on its time step. Um, and uh, you calculate the acceleration and jerk. You choose the particle which has to be updated soonest. Now, that means that you're not at the same time updating the positions of all of the other particles completely, but you do have to extrapolate their positions as well as you can to the time of the end of the time step of the particle which you've chosen to update. So then you do the predictor step, you compute the new acceleration and um, jerk at the end of the time step, you do the correction step in the army integrator, and then you advance, oh, sorry, you define uh, by some formula, and there's some magic in this as well, when is the next time you want to update that particle? And so that, uh, that gives you a new T next for that particle, and then you go back to step two and iterate until um, of any fact in the simulation. So that's the basic structure. And that's as much as I'm going to say about the code. <coughs> and uh, for the rest of it, what I'm going to say is um, about what the results mean and how this can be turned into good advantage in the study of the dynamical evolution of proper clusters. And the fundamental unanswered question about n body codes is. Do the results mean anything? And it is a question which has got no answer. And it's the fact that people do so many of these end body simulations is based actually on an article of faith. This is the second time I've mentioned faith in this lecture. <laughs> and in fact, you look, pardon? <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's very, very difficult to know that the simulation results are correct. And in some sense, one can be sure that they're not. Uh, there are no useful exact solutions to compare uh, an integrated model with. Uh, you do have conserved quantities. Um, 
the most sensitive of which turns out to be the total energy, and that should be conserved. Of course, if you have stellar evolution going on and the tide going on, you've got to take into account their effects on um, um, energy conservation, but that, 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 that can be done. And uh, here's an example of, um, in a, from a power run up to time 10, of the energy error which has been made in each um, enon unit of time. And you probably can't read the scale here, but it's logarithmic line from 10 to the minus 5 down to 10 to the minus 8. And that's the relative change. Uh, no, it's in, it's in uh, enon units, actually. So this is to be compared with the total energy of minus a quarter. Now, it's, it's just a community understanding that uh, an error per time unit of order 10 to the minus 6 is just about good enough. There's no more than a, a, a community understanding, I'm afraid. And I've asked the question at the bottom here, is this good enough? Is 10 to the minus 6 good enough, or does it have to be 10 to the minus 60? Nobody really knows, actually. And so this is where the article of faith uh, comes in. But I'll, I'll, I'll show you some basis for that uh, in just a minute. So you have to worry about um, whether your results uh, are useful. And one of the basic tests which you should always be carrying out when you're doing an end-body run is to keep asking the question, are these results reasonable? Can I understand why this uh, variable is moving in this direction? And it's precisely for that reason that I went through all of this sort of background theory about core collapse and uh, you know, expansion of the half mass radius and, and escape and things like this. Because you have to build up an intuition about what might go wrong and what should be right about uh, an M1 simulation. I'm not going to the extreme state of saying that you really have to know what the answer is before you start do your first simulation, but at least you shouldn't be caught unaware that your simulation is doing something stupid. I like this uh, quote from uh, Arthur Ed Eddington, uh, Landon Spitzer liked this very much, one should have the profoundest suspicion of any observational result which does not have a satisfactory explanation, which I often find is a very nice touchstone for observations. But the same is true of computational results. Okay? If there's no satisfactory explanation of what you're finding, then to uh, examine the findings is very hard. Okay, so I, I said a minute or two ago, one thing one can be sure of is that the answers are wrong. <coughs> and the basis of this is uh, a set of calculations like this. It's, it's, it's basically the sense of dependence on initial conditions. So you start two end body simulations with slightly different initial conditions, differing only by um, you know, the last bit, basically, in, in one of the positions of the particles. And you measure how fast in phase space the two simulations grow apart. And this is the logarithm of the separation according to some norm as a function of time. Time here is linear. And so this is an exponential divergence. There, there are half a dozen different simulations in here. And this is only for a 256-body problem. Dave Merritt and our, and our co-author uh, uh, some years ago uh, extended this to much larger systems. Uh, and the, the story is always the same one has this exponential divergence between neighboring solutions, which is an exponential explosion of error. And so when the, the magnitude of uh, this separation becomes comparable to the size of the star cluster, you can be sure that the stars are in the wrong place at the wrong velocity at that time. So you can be sure that the positions and velocities of the star are wrong. I would clarify that a little bit. Pardon? I would clarify that a little bit. They're actually shadowing terms uh, to say that for your initial conditions, the orbital, that there are guaranteed, generally speaking, in the Hamiltonian system, right? yeah. to be solutions with different initial conditions than the one you could. Yeah. So within epsilon of your solution all, at all times. All time. So in that right. sense, you pick some other problem. You could do, but uh, well, there are two objections to that actually. Because when it's been tried for an in-body simulation, you can only do the shadowing for so many times. And the, the the second argument is that there's no guarantee that the 
distribution of those shadowing orbits is typical of the distribution of initial conditions which you're trying to sample. That's, that's, so the, 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 these two issues make shadowing just a little bit less firm enough. I've got to do Yes, ma'am. So, so I think I missed something. So you said if you start doing body simulation, the different initial conditions, the difference exponentially, and then I think you said you attributed it to accumulation of errors, but isn't that just the nature of the chaotic system? It is. But how, how do you simulate the chaotic system in that case? That's accuracy. Yeah. So what you can do what you were suggesting, which is you give up on the idea of following the position of every single particle. For example, if you want to know the rate at which the core collapses, yes. that may well be fine. That's right. Yeah. And as you say, the one way to check that is to use answer analysis. Yes, so, is to use answer analysis. If you know theoretically <laughs> that the core ought to collapse at a certain rate, and you see that, then, then you feel better. Right. I, I, I like this answer analysis phrase. I've never, I've never heard it before, actually. It's, uh, it's, it, it, it sounds a good way of covering continuous. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so the, 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 the time scale of this uh, growth of exponential errors is actually a, a fraction run by a tenth of uh, crossing time. So since one does simulations which last for hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of crossing times, uh, you're clearly beaten in terms of the accuracy of the positions and velocities of the particles very, very quickly. Um, and it's an article of faith. Uh, we assume that the statistical properties of the simulation things like the evolution of the half mass radius, the time of core collapse, and so on. Now, one way of trying to investigate this has been uh, opened up by uh, Simon Bokri Spartan, a uh, student uh, in Charles Buchholz, uh, in the last uh, year or so. Um, what they did was actually to compare an n-body simulation with an exact simulation. In other words, they wrote a numerical package which would allow them to converge to the numerically exact result. Very, very time consuming business. I mean, sometimes you, start, you have to use you know, 100 decimal places or something like that. So the evolution is, is uh, very, very complicated. And unfortunately, it's restricted so far to the three body problem, which does exhibit some uh, aspects of the n body problem, uh, chaoticity in particular. Uh, and there is, well, yeah, I mean, you can read the result in this, uh, this letter, which I think has been published now in that day. Okay, my next um, uh, topic is uh, what I've um, graced with the word complexity. It's, it's simply a matter of just how long it's taking you to do these simulations and why it takes such a long time. How long it takes, I'll, 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 I'll show you in a minute. But remember the structure of the n-body uh, core, there was an initialization which was done only once. You have to find out which particle to uh, advance. In, in if, you, if, you, if you do a naive search, that's proportional to the number of particles. You have to extrapolate all the other particles, that's proportional to the number of particles. For each uh, particle advanced, you have to compute the acceleration and the jerk, and that's also proportional to the number of particles. Now, you can actually um, improve qu uh, quite a bit of this, in particular finding which is the next particle to advance. That can be done much more uh, quickly than by through the search. These, the, the extrapolation load can be shared uh, by uh, the introduction of something called block time step, which I have mentioned here. But you're always left with this problem of computing the acceleration and the um, jerk, and that's the uh, that's the basic effort of an n-body integration. And it's worthwhile just trying to estimate how much of an effort that is and how it depends on the number of stars and on the size of the system. Now, I haven't mentioned this before, but basically the typical time step is of the size of the um, separation between neighboring particles divided by their relative speed. Uh, I don't want to say any more to justify that, but in physical terms, you can see that a collision in principle could take place within a uh, time interval of that size. And although it's done in a different way, the formula which is generally used for time steps in n-body cores gives a result of this uh, kind. 
Now, the system uh, has a volume of order of the cube of the variable radius, thinking of this as being a typical radius 